You're listening to the Mind Your Own Business podcast, aimed at helping photographers learn how to make the leap from amateur to pro. Hello and welcome to the Mind Your Own Business podcast, a joint effort brought to you by PhotoFocus and Skip Cohen University. This is Shamira Young, and I'm joined by my amazing co-host, Skip Cohen. Skip, how are you? Wow, it took me a whole year to get to amazing <laughs> as my adjective. I, I appreciate that. It's so true. Have yeah. I used it before? Oh, I don't it's think you have. very fitting. No, and I, and, and I just, all I can say is thank you for thinking I'm still amazing when so often I've described you as making me sound better than I, <laughs> than I deserve. Um, for those of you that haven't figured it out, um, Shamira is the queen of the nerds. And she is yes. the geek behind us that makes this whole thing work every single time. So, well, um, thank you. I appreciate your <laughs> the skills you have that I never bothered with. So, we have a great show today, and I guess it's. The, it, do I get to introduce our guest now? Yes, please. As we've done Let's all do year it. long. Yeah, we have the perfect guest to wrap up 2020's podcast series. Uh, Tom Curley joins us today, and what a background he's had to date and is still having. He and I have worked together for years, going back to his Fuji film days and then Panasonic Lumix and the Ambassador Program, and now into the world of travel photography and education. He's one of the most approachable guys in the industry, always there to help artists raise the bar on the quality of their business. It might be marketing, and sometimes it might even be uh, their skill set in terms of how they're shooting and what they're doing. Best of all, he loves imaging. And while he doesn't earn his living as a working photographer, he's built a brand based on everything else it takes for a stellar reputation and stay focused on the end game instead of everything that gets in our way all the time during the process. He's also my best example of what I love most about our industry. It's the friendships that come out of everyone's love for the craft. So, Hey, buddy, if I haven't screwed something up technically <laughs> that Shamara will have to fix, this is the cue for your lips to move. Welcome to Mind Your Own Business. Well, thank you, Skip. I am thrilled to be here today. I love this show. Uh, thank you, Shamara. Uh, I'm not sure what makes me the perfect guest, but thank you anyway. <laughs> so, great to be well, here. I'll tell you what makes you the perfect guest. It's the diversity in your background and the number of photographers you have worked with over the years. Um, that that appreciate everything you've ever done, and even a few out there that maybe didn't appreciate it at the time, but sure did later on. I mean, you really have been a a, a tremendous help to so many people in this industry. So oh, I am it's... I am blessed to have been able to work with so many people, so many talented people with a passion for photography, and I hope to continue that for a long, long time. It and, works for us. You know, Tom, everybody in the, in the industry speaks so highly of you, and that's got to be for a reason, right? You know, that's why we're so excited <laughs> to have you on the on this show as our guest today. And Skip mentioned the diversity in your background. And, you know, I want to kick us off with, your, with our favorite first question about your background. Can you tell us how you got started in the photography industry? Well, sure. Uh, like so many of us in the in the industry, we started off with a camera in our hands, probably on the uh, you know the high school yearbook um, committee as the photographer. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I loved photography at the time and um, planned to go to college to pursue an education, but wasn't quite sure I wanted to be behind the camera uh, as a, the primary objective. So I got into the the both the science and the business management side of it. So. I knew I would be um, involved in the photo industry, uh, if not taking pictures. Uh, what I ended up doing uh, was getting a degree in uh, photo finishing technology. At the time, the primary objective was to make four by six prints, photos, as efficiently and economically as possible. And that's what we did for a long, long time. Think about it now. When's the last time you had a four by six made? <laughs> uh, maybe maybe we have, but uh, most people these days 
aren't printing like we used to. Remember twin prints? You got two four by six prints with every exposure on your roll of film. Okay, well, anyway, enough about that. <laughs> Obviously, I had to pivot. Um, and I did, um, kind of fast forwarding really quickly here. Uh, what I found is that um, with the dawn of digital photography, uh, I saw something on the horizon that I couldn't quite put into focus, and that was the tech side of it, computers. So I started early on, and it wasn't cheap. I remember my first uh, desktop computer, uh, I think it cost me $3,000, and it might have had a twenty. Uh, megabyte hard drive <laughs> but we learned computers we learned digital so by the time that rolled around in the 90s um, I felt that I was in a comfortable space to um, get out of optical analog printing uh, photography that is and um, put away the developer tanks you know and hop on the computer and here we are today. Uh, it's been a very, very exciting ride. You know, it's funny when you were talking about that first computer years. One of Julianne Koss' favorite expressions when I used to ask her if she could be, if she was available to speak or be on a project. I'm going back probably 15 years ago. Her favorite expression was, I'm really sorry, but I'm just out of bandwidth. <laughs> when was the last time we worried about bandwidth? Right. Yeah. And video, too. I mean, I know, Skip, you and I spent a few um, years. This is probably going back to the first couple of years we were working with Panasonic to promote the fact that, hey, these these cameras can also take video. They don't just take pictures, photos. So look where we are today. We're all YouTubing and having fun, learning about it editing video that's my new that's my new passion is uh, is really on the video side of things so but anyway yeah going back over the years how i got started in photography uh, i was really lucky um rochester institute of technology was the perfect place for me to to nurture and and grow and then venture out into the world um i was fortunate to have some really good jobs uh, working for all coincidentally uh, Japanese multinational companies, so um, it's another thing we'll, we'll we'll get into a little bit is um, my um, exposure to working in in the world of, of Japanese business. Hmm. Um, I've found it fascinating. I, I seem to have fit in nicely with that, and um, still love it to this day. So. Yeah, uh, the year you mentioned, the years at Fuji Film Skip, they were wonderful years. Um, I grew through uh, several positions there in product management and found myself working more um, with the end users in the professional side of the business. So that was a big start for me to kind of focus in on the pro side of our photography industry. And um, one of the things we did is develop a talent team and that was wonderful and that was really I think uh, the real start of my um, how I found myself contributing the most to the industry I think was was working with and managing uh, teams of um, like-minded people who had a passion for photography and were able to help us out with a little bit of an endorsement strategy to help promote the products. It worked. And I found myself essentially doing the same thing when I joined the Panasonic Lumix team. Um, and um, within the past decade, and that was even more successful. We did so many good things and still uh, the work is continuing on this to this day. However, uh, this year, um, and this this may come off sounding a little disconcerting when I when I share this with people, but 
this has been a most unusual and excellent year for me. Um, I know 2020, you don't hear many people saying 2020 was a great year. But for me, um, it's it's the year I decided to uh, make a big shift and work for myself after working for other people uh, for 40 years. So um, I did leave the corporate world um, as a full-time employee. Employment, but um, now I'm enjoying so many new opportunities uh, with the coming with the coming year. Wow, your 40 year comment just now. When I left Rangefinder and decided to go out on my own, it was 39 years. Hmm. That's yeah. I mean, it, there's, <laughs> there's there's a point where and I, and and I'd, I'd love you to comment on on if you agree with this. For me, I had gotten to a point where I really wanted to test the water and see if I could walk the talk. I mean, I, mm. I, I had worked with so many photographers and so many businesses, and WPPI was doing great, and people thought I was insane to leave in 2009 because it was at that time a horrible depression, de- depressive um, economy. Mm-hmm. And yeah. how in the world are you going to give it up? But I just wanted so badly to see if I if I could do it. And I remember Sheila saying to me, what are you afraid of? And I said, failure. And she was the motivation to help me stay focused on, all right, what are you going to do now? If let's let's take the leap of faith. So I'm 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 curious about what you went through in that process. And you and I had, had a few conversations over the over the last year when you were thinking about making a change. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it um, was a, a lot of factors involved in the decision to make the change. Um, my age, my health, which is good, but um, it, you know, I want to want to stay healthy, um, and um, both physically and mentally, you know, we have to treat ourselves as um, best we can so that we can remain productive. And I just saw myself shifting at this time. Uh, and taking a look at at these new opportunities. But this year, um, again, the timing was uh, kind of unusual, but in my favor, um, I I left the corporate world mid-year, and now here we are, sitting at home. What are we going to (laughs) do? Well, it's good. I feel like I've gone back to school, back to university. I'm taking online classes. Um, I'm the one, uh, I guess course topic, if you want to call it uh, like going back to school is I'm learning a language. I I've always uh, had kind of a slight dabbling in business etiquette, Japanese, um, but never really, uh, knuckled down to learn the language and always wanted to guess what (laughs) I'm spending at least an hour a day now learning Japanese. And I'll tell you something, for me at least, it's not easy. It's extremely hard. It's probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, And it's not just speaking and learning to recognize the spoken word, but guess what? There's also a written language. No, hold on. There's two separate (laughs) alphabets in the Japanese language. And uh, there's really three. Um, And man, it's fascinating. And like I said, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done, but I'm going to keep it up um, and continue with this. So I'm I'm having a ball with some of these um, things that I'm exposing myself to, mostly through the computer. You know, YouTube is a wonderful thing, too. But online courses um, have been an enriching way for me to get through this year, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Tom, I love your positivity. It is so refreshing to hear someone say that they're having positive ex- experiences in 2020. Imagine that. And, it, you know, it mm. sounds like you're excited to move forward and you're preparing to move forward. And I'd like to know whether it be um, you mentioned you're learning Japanese um, or earlier you touched on the Japanese business practices, which are, from what I hear, very different. 
than American, from American business practices. Um, but the things that you're doing now to prepare for the future, how do you plan to use those skills in the future now that you'll be essentially working for yourself in your own business? Well, uh, working uh, with the Japanese is, is, yes, it's different than working um, domestically here mm -hmm. with, um, you know, just people we we know and work with who are American. But I think uh, any any country, any culture is going to have its unique um, styles and customs, and it doesn't take much to learn them. Um, I think in any in any culture, let's take Japan for example, working with Japanese either here in the USA or in Japan or or anywhere, you just have to recognize that um, you have to respect their culture and not come you know blustering in and make social faux pas um, that would be embarrassing to to them and to you. So. It's just learn a few things. It's not that difficult. The classic example is um, in Japanese business culture is the um, sharing of business cards. Um, I think most of us have heard this. And sure, whether you're in a meeting, on a trade show floor, or, or anywhere, when you meet a Japanese business person for the first time, they will typically hand you a business card, and you are expected to... Uh, return the favor by presenting your own business card. Now, here's the thing, though. Um, it's easy to notice this if, if you have your eyes open, but the Japanese business person will present that business card to you with two hands holding the top two corners um, very lightly without covering up any of the text and presenting it to you um, under, your, under your chin, you know, uh, in your face, and holding it there for a moment, and you are expected to accept it, hold it in your own hand without covering the letters, and read it, not just, you know, say, hey, thanks, and shove it in your pocket. Wow. Then you have to do the same thing yourself. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> and make sure that business card isn't some old raggedy, dog-eared thing you've had in your wallet for the last year and a half. Make sure it's brand new, clean, and not bent or anything so little things there, like that oh. yeah there are two things you want to remember one is you don't want to hand back a card that says pizza orange juice and milk on the back because um, <laughs> it's been in your wallet with what your wife asked you to pick up on on your way home but i mean i, I fell in love with my first trip to japan in 81 and wound up with about 10 trips over the years between polaroid a couple with hasselblad and I'm hoping one more because I want to get Sheila there. But on the business card thing, and this is kind of funny, Shamir, because you don't, you don't realize it. I had my cards. Obviously, I had my Japanese card, um, which said everything my English card did. But also, my middle initial was printed, um, so I recognized it, which is B, oh. because it's the only way I would know which way to hand the card back <laughs> with two hands. So while I couldn't actually read the card because it was all in Japanese, I knew which way to hand it. And it really is it really is a sign of, of respect. So is that 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 short um, bow, not not a not a, a you know, a swooping uh, bow like, you know, you're starring in The King and I uh, in a remake, <laughs> but just, you know, just the the respect. Yes, and it's it's a very it's a very cool thing because you look at, um, to me always it was the Japanese the leaders in technology, but at the same time, committed to two thousand years of samurai slash business history in terms of the way they did things. It's, it really is pretty remarkable. So, Tom, you know, what's so cool about talking about the business side of photography? I mean, this is why I geek out about it is because really anyone can take a decent image these days, especially with, at least that's how I feel with the advances in technology. But what separates the amateurs from the pros is understanding the business side and dealing with people, uh, whether they be from Japan or America or any country, understanding that 
it's so important to diversify your skill set as far as business practices goes, not just image making. And I'm curious if you would kind of elaborate on any other aspects um, that might come to you as far as the importance of diversity in your skill set. What are some of the things that photographers should really keep in mind these days um, as far as growing their business? What skills should they have? Well, we already talked about the need to adapt, you know, as, as we moved out of um, optical silver halide photography into digital photography. Mm -hmm. And then, as I mentioned, video. Um, I, I don't think there are many photographers out there today who haven't at least thought about adding video to their skill set um, or have uh, already done so. And maybe it's not as a product that they'll sell to their clients, but maybe just as a process of uh, self-promoting uh, or promoting their own business. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. So yeah, video, video, video. Um, we live in a world of screens. Uh, to quote my, my good friend, Julio Ishorio, <laughs> um, we live in a world of screens. So that's one thing is um, adapt and learn the new technologies. Um, promoting one's business, too, is a constant thing. That's all about social media, right? Get on the platforms. Uh, establish yourself with uh, the, your brand. What is it? How do, how do you want people to recognize you as a photographer, as an image maker? What do you have to offer? Make sure that's prominently featured in your own branding through the social media outlets, whether it's Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, whatever. When you talk about that, diversity and I think about you getting into Japanese there's a great line about growth only occurs outside your comfort zone uh, there are so many things that photographers need to be doing now and I, I've, I've written it and we even talked about it before the podcast um, hunkering down is about your health it's not about your business and your growth and when you were talking about Japanese I was thinking in the same way you're looking at expanding not just a language, but starting to understand even more about a culture that you love. And I know that part of your your travel goal is going to wind up in in places in in the Far East. It also got me thinking about photographers and the need to expand your skill set. So, you know, I mean, this is the perfect time for a wedding photographer, for example, to be fine tuning their skills in macro and close up work because the world is tired of bad ring shots and flower shots and details <laughs> and you have to be a better storyteller and then you brought up video and the power of understanding video um, i would love to see everybody get rid of these um, some of them are good but for the most part most of everybody's about page and bio page are, are very similar and yet if they did a one minute video on why they love the craft on why they love working with their clients on why their clients and what their clients do to trust them and i'd love to get you talking a little bit about this whole new direction you're going in not just in terms of learning japanese but where do you see that diversity now starting to apply to you as you go into this next chapter and start looking at getting more involved in travel photography, not just to capture pictures, but to get to know other cultures and expand everybody's, um, that educational side of what you know about the world and can grow. Right. That's so, a long point. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so we are looking at uh, launching next year um, Silk Road Tours, which we'll be focused on travel and culture in Southeast Asian countries. Um, it's very, very exciting. I could talk about this all day, but um, I started about five years ago um, kind of with a focus on, on this goal of being able to have frequent trips, you know, maybe a couple times a year um, to these countries bring along some photographer friends and uh, 
take a lot of pictures, but it's so much more than that. Um, it's it's seeing the sights, it's eating the food, it's meeting the people. Um, there's just so much. Um, we also learn about traveling efficiently, traveling lightly, um, perhaps just with one bag. <clears throat> That's not checked on the airplane. There's, there's so many little nuances to travel these days that um, one can quickly learn <clears throat> and um, become more efficient in doing so. Then there's the camera equipment. Traveling light uh, means small compact cameras. Well, guess what? We have those these days. We don't have to lug around the big camera unless we want to. There's a lot of choices out there, but learning what those choices are and how to utilize them most effectively and efficiently while traveling super light. Um, so, yeah, the travel part of it with photography as a focus is really exciting. Um, the three countries we're focused in on the most are Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, and Thailand. Um, not to mention Japan, of course. Um, there's a little bit of a difference there in, in the realities of travel. Japan's a very expensive country. The other three countries I just mentioned are just the opposite. They're super cheap to travel um, and um, stay on a really small budget and um, enjoy it a lot. So there's a reason for that. Um, just to take a quick look at, at each of the three countries, Vietnam, I visited in 2016 for the first time. Um, absolutely wonderful. Um, if, if you haven't looked at it, and you think, oh, Vietnam, that's, um, that's, that's, they had a war there. Why would I want to go there? <laughs> it's a beautiful country, but most importantly, the people love tourists. They love visitors, and they welcome you with open arms. Oh. Um, and by the way, they call it the American War. Um, <laughs> so um, we're looking at going there about a year from now, November of 2021 um cambodia i have to tell you a, a, a sh i'll i'll try to make it a quick story but this is my passion uh the roots of my passion for cambodia about 25 years ago i i met and worked with a, a gentleman who was a um on the faculty at mit massachusetts institute of technology in the in the media lab there he and his colleagues were involved in some uh, volunteer work that was focused on building schools uh, for children in Cambodia. And I was fascinating by what they were doing. Basically, in a nutshell, they had an organization that would raise money um, and for $15,000 at the time, this is 25 years ago, you could have a school built either in your name or someone that you wanted to dedicate the school to. For 300 children, the building, the solar panels on the roof, and a laptop computer for every child. The World Bank would match the funds, so $30,000 built those that school for 300 kids they built over 600 of them oh my goodness and i said i want to be involved in something like that someday well guess what i'm doing it um probably hopefully next year i will be going over and doing some volunteer work um i want to teach english the the cambodian people have a absolute top priority to have their children and even adults learn English. If you learn English, you can get a good job. So I've got a dialogue with a, a school in a small village. Um, maybe it's not so small. They probably have a hundred kids. Um, and um, I'm working that through. So I'm going to add that on to my trip as a side trip and work into that. As far as Thailand, all I'm going to say is temples. Temples, temples, temples. It's a Buddhist culture, and there are 
thousands of temples all across the country. Most of them are beautiful. Some are exceptionally beautiful. And guess what? They're great subjects to photograph. So um, I've actually built a database, a personal database of my favorite temples uh, inside of Google Maps um, all over the country. And um, so excited to go back. <clears throat> that is so cool. Talk about immersing yourself in the culture. And, and just hearing you talk about it, Tom, I hear the passion in your voice. And it, it, that's just, that's so exciting. And I know you're looking forward to 2021 for sure when you can get out and start doing this. Did you mention the group size, by the way? Um, as far as when photographers are traveling with you, how big are the groups going to be? Yeah, very small. We're looking at four, maybe five people. Oh, that's awesome. Um, not quite ready to graduate into the eight to ten group size because there's different logistics for that. You gotta you gotta get buses and minivans and things like that. Um, we're doing very small groups, so let's say there might be four of us. Um, we can easily all pile into an SUV. Um, I have uh, relationships with local guides in all three countries, and this year I'm maintaining uh, my dialogue with them, you know, um, emails and messaging, sharing uh, things through social apps, um, and they're very forthcoming. Uh, the local guides, they're basically all out of work, so they're more than happy to stay in touch with um, tour organizers um, in the hopes that uh, we'll be able to get over there sooner than later next year. <clears throat> so yeah, small group size and um, it's kind of freelance. We have itineraries uh, planned out, but they're very flexible. We're even booking um, hotels on the run so we can be that nimble and flexible. Nice. First, first two nights are booked hotel upon arrival, uh, acclimate to the time zone change and so forth. But then beyond that, we're apt to just uh, wing it, book a flight if we need to go somewhere the day before we fly, and we're booking our hotel rooms for that night um, on Agoda, <laughs> on our phones. It's so exciting. This is great stuff. It, it, this ties so much into just the word diversity in terms of whatever you do. Even as mm -hmm. is, even from the photogra pure photographic side, when you were talking about you know scaling down what's going to be in your camera bag and traveling with one bag, um, Sheila and I have gotten into watching the the tiny the tiny house station, and the fun of it is watching people go from two three thousand square foot homes down to one hundred and fifty to three hundred square feet in a in a tiny home. Well, it's mm -hmm. no different in terms of what you're going to take with your camera gear. And I remember years ago, Vince LaFerre speaking at a program we were doing, and and he said, um, you know what you do when you don't have a lens that's long enough? And everybody's sitting there, no, what do you do? He said, well, you stop winding and you're moving closer. <laughs> so understanding your camera gear um, so that you can go on a trip like this and still get great results and and know what you're doing. I mean, it all ties together. And I hate the fact that that we're we're actually out of time, but we have a favorite question we always like to close with, and that's for you, Tom. What advice would you give a young or old photographer just starting out today? That's really easy because I usually give the same answer to a question like this, and the answer is networking. Mm. Start networking with people in your community, whether it's your business community, um, this people who have similar occupations or focuses of styles that you have, um, join groups, get on LinkedIn, get on all the social media platforms, of course, but um, networking, um, show your interest share it with others and meet as many people as you can over the years uh, you will grow your uh, contact list um, to a size that it's beyond count 
thousands and thousands and thousands of people you'll meet if you're early in your career as you progress through the years and get where you want to be. Um, remain passionate about what you do. Focus very hard on that specialty that you want your clients to recognize you as. Um, but above, above all that, it's networking. Meet as many people as you can in the business that you're in. Great advice. Perfect answer. Great advice. And Tom, I want to make sure and ask, where can folks find you online? I spend a lot of time on Instagram. Love it. Um, it's not quite the same as it used to be because um, uh, when, it, when, when I started using it, it was a, it was a platform for sharing art, the, art, the art of photography. Uh, now there's just way too many food pictures. And uh, if I see one political post, it's goodbye. Uh, so, yeah, I'm T Curly One, the number one T Curly One at Instagram. Um, I'm on YouTube. Love making those videos. Um, T Curly there. Uh, T Curly on Twitter as well. A um, little bit of Facebook. I have a Facebook uh, page, Tom Curly Photography. Um, and uh, Silk Road Tours 2020 as well. So, yeah, love it. And uh, would love to connect with people. Um, I'm always available. You can reach me through any of those platforms. And I'm always available to connect with just about anybody. Fantastic. And just to clarify, the Silk Road Tours 2020, is that dot com? Will that be the website? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's Facebook only. Facebook. So, okay. So that's yeah. where people can find out if they want to possibly join mm -hmm. yeah. one of your tours. Just follow along. We're sharing a lot of uh, links and cultural items that um, we find of interest there, too. Excellent. We'll make sure to include that in the show notes for sure. And Skip, where can folks hunt you down online? It's always the same. Everything I write is at skipcohenuniversity.com. And I'm Skip Cohen on Twitter. I'm Skip Cohen on Facebook. And we always remind everybody that we're looking for your input and feedback and suggestions of guests or topics that Shamir and I cover in this podcast. And my email is skip at mei500.com. And now and then you'll also find me over at platypod.com where I have fun wearing the hat of CMO, mm -hmm. um, which is a very fancy word for doing a little bit of everything, but great product and great people. And Shamira, where are they going to go to find you? Folks can send me an email at, that's my email is Shamira at photofocus.com. That's my first name, C-H-A-M-I-R-A at photofocus.com. We love getting questions and ideas and feedback because that does shape how we move forward with this show. And we are super excited to move forward with this show, especially going into 2021. We're looking forward to having amazing guests. And speaking of amazing guests, Tom, this was amazing. Thank you. Such well, thank great you stuff so today. much. Yeah, yeah, really, really good insight and content. This is fun. Yes. It is so much fun. And we want to thank our listeners for joining us as well. Please tell your friends about this podcast, especially if they have the burning desire to improve their photography business. We look forward to having you with us next time on the Mind Your Own Business podcast, brought to you by Photofocus and Skip Cohen University.